this through conference will now be recorded. Is, is, is a little difficult to, to, to sustain. So I, I thank John quite a bit. And, and all of you for coming on to this webinar and, and being stakeholders and, and becoming involved and becoming aware of the word. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people who've been involved with this for a long time, but getting the public investment and getting a better understanding among uh, people who uh, could, would potentially be impacted by this, such as property owners, marinas, uh, uh, land trust, landowners, uh, it, it, that this is really important. Um, and I really appreciated Humphrey's last slide where he got everybody going on how to better communicate. I actually shared that on another project that we're working on for another thing at RCMD. So, John, next slide. I'm going to, um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to kick it over to, to, to Greg and Summer. Um, but what I want to to do is, uh, and then when we get to the end, I want to just leave it open to questions uh, to let Greg and Summer close out questions. I'm going to go quiet and dormant on this side. So I'm kind of, I'm going to be here, but I'm going to kind of leave you with what our next steps are from Connecticut RCND. We're going to, the environmental review team will develop a, uh, a lower Connecticut River hydrology, hydrilla management report for the 12 towns that sought this uh, report a year ago. And we're going to focus on the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station's findings from 2019 and anything subsequent. Uh, an overview and work of existing stakeholders and partners who've been involved uh, through the process. Um, and then potential sources of funding recommendations toward management of this project and, and types of outreach that we could begin to look at. And then recommended next steps for those towns that are uh, interested in, in handling this situation and, and becoming better stewards of, uh, of the issue um, and, uh, and, and creating a, a stakeholder involvement with their in the own community. So with that further said, I am going to turn it over to Greg and Summer, um, and I believe they're going to do a screen share. Okay. Okay, Greg, you should be a presenter, so you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, thanks. We've got Summer taking care of this part. <laughs> All right, should be good. Okay, can everybody see this uh, slide that says Invasive Aquatic Plant Survey Gateway Conservation Zone? Yep. Yes, okay, good. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, a survey we performed uh, last uh, summer on the Gateway Conservation Zone. You can see in the slide, uh, if you don't know, it it basically comes from the northern part of uh, well, the hand, the northern hand, Adam border on south to Long Island Sound. Uh, it represents approximately one third of the Connecticut portion of the Connecticut River. Obviously there's a lot more river heading up to Canada, but uh, you know this this is a great was a great start to see what was going on in this um, uh, this this southern section of the river. Um, here's a picture. I guess uh, some people uh, you know uh, don't fully understand in my mind, and I didn't uh, just what a sort of natural resource that the southern section of the Connecticut River is, and just how much of it is rather unspoiled and pretty much left to wildlife. This is uh, a school of striped bass that was feeding uh, one day when we were out there. And, um, you know, you, you just see all sorts of um, uh, the wildlife, eagles, you know, egrets, and, and tremendous numbers of juvenile menhaden. I was really shocked at that. Uh, and, and menhaden or juvenile bunkers are considered one of the most important uh, fish in the ocean due to all the the the, um, the the fish and uh, wildfowl and everything else that feeds on it uh, and, and that sort of thing. But we were um, really brought into this because of a plant that was found there uh, and we identified uh, and then uh, actually did some genetic work on for this plant called hydrilla, which had not been found in the Connecticut River prior to a few years ago. I'm sure it was there prior to that no one saw it, but we don't think it was there in the mid-90s uh, when another survey was done. 
uh, of this section, a very thorough survey, and it was not mentioned. Um, but it is a plant which is extremely troublesome. It's considered the most um, troublesome uh, uh, submerged aquatic plant in the southern states in Florida, you know, the Carolinas and that area. Uh, it harbors, um, uh, at least in, in, uh, in, in the southern states, it harbors a blue-green algae, which has been known to actually kill eagles uh, and other uh, raptor-type birds. Um, we have not found that algae, in, in, and we haven't looked that hard, but we have not found it in, in uh, Connecticut. But it's always it's a worry. Uh, you always think when you see these southern plants in a northern area that it could be a climate change issue, and uh, certainly we cannot rule that out. Um, just a little bit about this plant. And by the way, there's other other plants in here uh, in in the river that we found. We we didn't just look for hydrilla. We looked for all invasive species. These are not native plants uh, in in the river system, uh, and we did find other ones. I'll mention in a minute. Uh, but the hydrilla was the greatest concern. Um, just a little bit about the plant. Uh, it has multiple ways of, of reproducing. It creates these dense stands. This is a picture just outside of um, the Salmon River um, uh, in, in the main stem of the, um, of the Connecticut uh, on, on the point there. And uh, this hydrilla is dense. You can't really get a boat through it uh, without rowing it or something. Motors get clogged. Uh, it does often uh, come out of the water at low tide, which is a little unusual. It, it, it apparently can survive dry periods a little, uh, to some extent. Uh, it has, uh, it can reproduce by fragmentation, fragments of the plant breaking apart and moving and then rerouting. Uh, it has these structures called turions, which is on the uh, stems, uh, which is sort of a hardened bud that is an asexual means of reproduction. It's not a seed per se, um, but very, very difficult uh, to control once it gets into sediment. Uh, and very, very uh, well, uh, it does a very good job of reproducing the plant over many years. These seeds can last for, for many, many years once they get into sediment. Uh, hydrilla, at least traditional hydrilla, and we're going to talk about this as maybe not being tr tr traditional here in Connecticut anyway has these tubers, which are like mini potatoes uh, in the ground that can reproduce the plant. They're in the sediment. They can go down 12 inches deep sometimes and be very resistant to management, uh, management procedures. Uh, so this plant is a problem. There's no question about it. Um, and it also disrupts habitat. We're going to talk about some eelgrass beds in a minute that it is infringing on. Um, let's see here. Let's see if I can get this. The arrow, the arrow on the keyboard. Arrow on the keyboard. All right, there we go. So I mentioned that this hydrilla that was found is different than what had been found in, in, in our previous studies. We got some genetics done uh, with the University of Wisconsin, uh, Whitewater, with uh, Dr. Nick Tipperary there, who we had worked with in the past on some things. He's a geneticist, and he um, he he did the genetics on this. Uh, it's hydrilla. This is the Connecticut River hydrilla. This is hydrilla found um, in, uh, let's see, this one here is, uh, this is uh, uh, Held Pond, I believe, in Weston. See how small it is compared to this, how much different it looks. And this is the Mystic Seaport Pond, where the first hydrilla in the state was found um, about 20 years ago, right outside of Mystic Seaport. Uh, in the pond there. It's interesting how that might have got there from, the, from giving where it is, but anyways, it is. But you can see this, this is a much um, more robust plant. I mean, it's actually it was broken off here. We had, in order to get it on the mount, you had to break it. It's so tall. Um, and, uh, you know, very, very, it, it, it just, when we did the genetics on it, it did not come out as anything known yet to have been sequenced. Not to say it, it's, it's completely unique, but certainly there's been many sequences of, um, of, of hydrilla, and this was different than any that had been currently sequenced. So that tells us that it, it could easily be something that has not been studied before from the standpoint of management. We may not know as much about how it reproduces, uh, how persistent it is, all this sort of thing. I mentioned the eelgrass beds, and um, we're concerned about these. These are eelgrass beds, and they're considered a prime habitat for fish. 
um, uh, and that sort of thing in the river system. This is freshwater eelgrass. It's not saltwater, the Zostera marina, saltwater eelgrass you'll hear a lot about. But this is not, this is freshwater eelgrass called Valsneria americana. And it is uh, much like the saltwater version, an extremely valuable habitat. And you can see hydrilla, you know, is definitely encroaching into it. And that's a concern that it could re replace it. Uh, it's not known whether it would be as good a, a habitat. It could be a pretty good one. And that's when you talk to the fisheries people, they may say, hey, you know, what's the big deal? Maybe it is a good habitat after all. Um, but again, when you see these juvenile bunkers, particularly uh, uh, Manhattan in these eelgrass beds, uh, it makes you wonder that, you know, this really valuable natural resource could be impacted if, if it gets replaced with hydrilla. So we did a, 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 an invasive aquatic vegetation survey um, uh, on the conservation, um, this gateway conservation zone I mentioned from Haddam on south. Prior to that, the year before, we did a preliminary survey with a bunch of partners uh, of the majority of the Connecticut River up through Vermont, New Hampshire, and we, the, the hydrilla was only found at the Connecticut border south. So we are uh, pretty much alone, a little bit in Massachusetts, southern Massachusetts. As you go north, there's really none. Uh, so we, with that information, we then were funded through um, uh, the Gateway um, Group and uh, also, Eight Mile River, uh, Scenic River, also uh, did some funding, um, a, a part of that, and we can't leave them out. And there's a lot of other helpers like Margo and just a ton of people that really helped us get this thing off the ground. Gene, Riley, uh, uh, to name a few. Um, so this is just, a, we're not going to talk too much about this at the moment, other than showing this is Haddam on south. You see a bunch of different colors here, and the colors stand for the different um, uh, abundances in different species we found. So hydrilla was the, the most prevalent and in, in, invasive in, the, in this uh, section of the river. Uh, it's the tan colors, goldish tan colors, but there was also a lot of Eurasian water mill foil, and there was also some fan wart, uh, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how to identify it, but it's all going to be in our report, um, in, uh, which is coming out next week, which we'll get you copies of. Uh, and also water chestnut was found. Now, Margo and a lot of others have done a lot of harvesting of this, and most of it was harvested prior to us getting on the, doing our survey, but we did find some new locations and they were um, uh, relayed to Margo, who relayed them to DEP or, uh, or others to get out there and do some harvesting. We also did some harvesting if it was just a few plants after we marked it. You can see as you get to the southern part of the river, we think it just gets too salty. Uh, you see virtually no, none of the invasive down in there. Uh, when you get up into some of the tributaries, you get up into Lord's Cove. Um, as you get further in, you begin to pick up some of these invasives as well. Uh, you can see, for instance, the Salmon River. Um, you can go quite a ways up and you'd find hydrilla. And then from here on up, we didn't find any anymore. Uh, we're not sure whether that's just because it hasn't gotten there yet, it's working its way north, or whether there's some chemistry of water or whatever that's causing that. So we, we um, these all our points are georeferenced. We had pretty uh, uh, sophisticated computers on the boat uh, to mark using GPS um, the with very very accurate with, with some meter accuracy really uh, where these uh, areas are. Uh, the, uh, we, we, if there was a patch, a large patch, we'd circumnavigate the patch with the trimble, with the um, global positioning system on, computer on, and then we got through circumnavigating the patch, we'd close it uh, as a, what's called a polygon, and then that would then be georeferenced uh, to make our maps. Uh, there's um, really a few habitats of note that I think uh, when we were out there have to be uh, sort of kept in mind. There's what's called the main stem of the river, and generally the main stem, except for some shallow shoaling in the middle occasionally, everything was along the shore, usually in less than three or four feet of water. And once you got beneath, went to deeper than that, we didn't find any of these invasive species. Um, you know, it, the water is generally not very clear in the river, and, and plants need light to grow, and as it gets deeper, it gets difficult. There's also, I think, abrasiveness of sediment. There's river flow ice 
whatever that could be removing some of this from some of these areas. But in the deep section, it's just simply too deep. So there's the main stem, and there's also the coves. Many people are concerned about the coves. Selden Cove, uh, obviously, is one which there's a lot of people concerned about. Whalebone Cove, uh, you know, there's groups that are trying to protect that. We did do uh, get up into Whalebone Cove, and a lot of hydrilla in there. You can see this whole section of the cove is uh, pretty much full of hydrilla. Uh, we did not look at things like Phragmites. They're not in the water, so those are not something that we, we dealt with. Um, so there's the, you know, there's the coves, and I think these are some of the largest impact areas are the coves. Uh, and when we talk about management, maybe coves can be managed differently than, say, the main stem because they're kind of, you know, uh, closed off and, uh, you know, the, the management may be uh, a little easier there. There's also the marinas. This is Chris Holm Marina up here, and you can see this is mainly had milfoil. See the pinks here. Uh, there's some fan ward in there, the greens. Uh, once we got down here to the other marinas, Chester Marina, Hazen, uh, Haven, uh, Chester Point Marina, uh, then you got combinations of things. Here it was mainly Eurasian water milfoil. As you get up here, it was hydrilla and a lot of fan wart, which is the green. Um, and and what, I'm going to be putting Summer on a minute, and she's developed an app for people to go to on their computer or even their iPhones or phones, uh, smartphones to get closer in views of everything, and she's going to go over how to use it. So I'm not going to go into too much more detail on the individual areas. But again, we have marinas, we have main stem, we have coves, and we have tributaries. And I mentioned how, you know, in some of these tributaries, uh, it goes quite a ways in. And, uh, you know, when we're talking about management, you generally want to know what's upstream from you, because what's upstream can make its way downstream and reinfest anything that you manage. And we're going to talk about the need to survey the remaining part of the Connecticut River and our hopes that we're going to do that in a minute. Just some more pictures of, uh, of the hydrilla as we've seen it. Again, this is the same picture outside of the Salmon uh, uh, River boat launch uh, getting into the main stem. The, the Portland Boat Works Marina, uh, you can see this is there's some algae involved here, but this hydrilla. And a lot of these marina uh, operators are very concerned that it's going to affect their ability to do business. Um, and it's just a Selden Cove where there's, again, you often will see this alpha mat on top of the invasives. And we you see that in a lot of places. And we're not sure whether there's some release of nutrients from the actual vegetation causing this algal to be more prolific, whether it's just a good place for it to um, just sort of uh, attach and get started. This is a big patch of, um, of water or chestnut, which uh, we found here, which we relayed and, 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 and Margot got a boat out there to get that harvested. So this is kind of what type of things we look for. As I say, at low tide, this is pretty much exposed. So that's a little different, particularly when it comes to management. It could have some advantages. You can get out there at low tide, do something, or disadvantages that uh, if you're using, say, an herbicide, that, that it's not going to be uh, uh, in, in contact with it. So what more did we find before I put summer on? Um, these are the plants we found. We found six of them, curly leaf pondweed, Eurasian water milfoil, fan wart, hydrilla, variable leaf water milfoil, tiny bit, and water chestnut. Hydrilla, was we found a hundred, a total of 189 acres of it in that southern section. Um, and Eurasian water milfoil, a total of 130 acres. And you can see the darker the uh, part of the bar, that's the, that's the abundance of it. If it's if it's very abundant, it's usually to the surface. It's very much a nuisance to anybody trying to get a boat into it and that sort of thing. And then downward to here where you probably would hardly notice it. I'm going to turn this over to um, Summer right now. And she's going to talk about the app. She can, if you have, you want to see certain areas, certain coves, certain marinas, whatever, she can show you how you zoom in and, 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 and determine exactly what was there. So Summer, go ahead. Alrighty, hi everyone. I know we're running a little late on time, but um, just give us a minute. So I'm pulling the app up. And so you can get this from our website, um, ct.gov slash CAES, and you can pull this up. And right away you have um, all of our data is on display for you. I also have the state boat launches that you can access. You can click on the boat launch and it will tell you the name and the launch type that it is. 
So there's a couple different tools on here. Let me get this full screen. Um, you have the legend here, and it will show the points versus patches, points for any area that was smaller than a square meter, and then you have the patches, and the abundances are shown as well. So the lighter colors are a lower abundance. And then with the layer list, you're actually able to turn these on and off because what we have found with the um, stationary maps is you can't see the polygons when they're layered over each other. So if you look at here, these are a couple of different marinas in Chester and you can turn all the layers off. And what I like to do is then go in and turn them on. And then that was the hydrilla. This is the Eurasian water milk foil. And this is the fan wart. So the fan wart, you wouldn't be able to see if you had the hydrilla over it. And then there are another, um, <coughs> other information we have is you can click on a patch and it'll give you the abundance, the date that we were there and the time, the latitude and longitude, as well as the area in acres. And I have some bookmarked places over here, which were areas of concern, a lot of uh, marinas, creeks and coves. So for example, we can go to Chris Holm Marina. This was chock full of hydrilla, um, also has some fan wart, and then it had Eurasian water milfoil as well. And again, this you can't see the Eurasian water milfoil if you have the um, hydrilla on top of it. But we also took transects and you were, you're able to click on each point and you can see the surveyor, the depth, the substrate, uh, how far we were from the shore, and then the abundance of each species that we found at each point. So there's a lot of information, a lot of ways to play with this. You can change the base map. Uh, right now I have the basic imagery up. You can also change it to say the navigation or there's not much going on here because we're kind of far away from the streets, but in other areas the streets show up a bit better. And then there's also this search up at the top, so you can search your own address or something else you have in mind, such as Hatta Meadows State Park. So you can click on that, and then you can go to the river, and let me just change it back to imagery so you can see it a bit better. And then here you see the Eurasian water milfoil at an acreage of three and a half, and then right underneath it, or on top of it, is the hydrilla patch. So you can see them both here. So there are a lot of ways to play with this. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. Um, you can share it. You can uh, print it. You can add your own bookmarks to it. This home button will take you directly to the beginning where we opened up. And once I turn all the layers on, you will see the rest of the data. And that's all I have for now. Um, but feel free to reach out to me with questions or um, any additional information you think I could add um, and yeah, I'll turn it back over to Greg. I think you have to click on here with the mouse. Yep, now you're good. This one? You can use the arrow too, but yeah. All right, so we've done the survey of this section. So a lot of people say, okay, what are you going to do now? How are you going to solve the problem? Now this gets a little more dicey. Uh, first of all, what are our options? Well, this one option is to do nothing. Um, wait, see what happens. Um, hope it goes away. You know, do a lot of things like that. Um, and sometimes, if we don't have enough information to move forward with an, with an option, that may be best. And one thing I, I mentioned, we think we really need. We've got to get the the remaining portion of the. Connecticut River survey, and we are planning on doing that this summer. Uh, and I'm jumping ahead a bit, but uh, it looks like we're going to get some funding from DEEP in order to finish the survey up to the Massachusetts line. So that's good. So once with that, and then we'll know what's up north. We'll know, you know, uh, what, you know, you know, how, how much it is, how much, uh, you know, where is this stuff? Is it in tributaries? Is it in, I don't know, some of the major coves like Weathersfield Cove? You know, well, what's up north for you? What will come back to reinfest you if you just say manage your end and not up north? So that's going to be a valuable um, part of, of getting things um, moving. Uh, 
then where do you go from there? Well, as I said, there may be some people say, well, you know, this just is, this is a you know, hundred miles of shoreline or whatever, or two, you know, with maybe more, maybe 200 miles of this in a big river system. And how are you going to do that? I mean, I just, yeah, where, where are you going to get the money to do it? I, you know, and and that's going to have to be dealt with as, as, as well. But I can tell you that um, from a standpoint of um, what has been done and what we, you know, what has been done in other areas, uh, one of the projects we look to is the Croton River, where New York State Department of Environmental uh, Conservation did uh, some work with an herbicide, sort of it's like a sort of a drip system where you drip it upstream, uh, a very what's considered a very environmentally friendly product. That drips into the system and then travels downstream and, and does and, and can control uh, hydrilla, for instance. And uh, uh, I have a graph here, and it, it worked pretty good. Uh, and that particular hydrilla had what's called tubers, those little potatoes type things that are in the sediment, which are very difficult to control. The hydrilla we're finding in the river so far does not have those. And we may be found wrong. Somebody may find some, but we had did a pretty good search last year. We didn't find any. So that could be helpful. You know, there's other things. There's like bottom blankets for small areas like marinas. These are blankets you smother it with. We've done research on that with these, and they work pretty good. You only need them in place for like four weeks, and then you can move them, and you get pretty good control. And there's been some interest from marinas. Uh, there's some interest for harvesting. Uh, can you pull it out? Um, uh, you know, or get a machine to pull it out, a harvesting machine, and that's a possibility, particularly if you don't have a lot of tubers uh, in the sediment that can regrow it. Um, but that would be a possibility, is to, is to try to harvest it. But again, it's it's a submersed plant. Um, you know, one good thing about water chestnut is it's at the surface. You can see it, you can grab it, you know, and you can you can you can harvest it uh, easier than some of the stuff that's on the bottom. Um, there's that option. Uh, you know, so, you know it's going to come up. You know, biological controls, um, and that's really the gold standard if you can find one. Uh, right now, the only biological control we have in Connecticut, and only one I see in the certainly in the in in the future for a while anyway, is what's called grass carp, and these are these weed-eating fish that put in lakes and, and and ponds for 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 eating vegetation. They do a pretty good job. Um, but they're not selective. Uh, they eat just about anything they want. Um, they are migratory, meaning that they probably end up in Vermont uh, sooner or later, uh, and you may be controlling their weeds with introductions here. They tend to go upstream. Um, they have to be sterile, and they have to be permitted by deep, uh, so they're a sterile form of this fish. They're not going to reproduce. But I just think that's going to be a stretch. There's state listed species of plants in the river, which are a red flag to putting a, 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 a biological control like grass carp that would not be, uh, uh, you know, not, not know the difference between the good and the bad uh, plants. Uh, basically eat probably everything. So that's, that's probably not going to work for the moment. So where we are really is with, um, again, a, a um, I'm going to go to the next slide here. A, um, a a future that entails, first of all, issuing a final report, which we're going to have out. We just finished that up this week. Uh, have it out next week. We want to get it to Gateway first, since they funded it. I have them look it over and uh, uh, see see what they say. Um, we want to survey the remaining portion of the river, and we believe it's not 100%, but we believe we have the funding um, uh, promised to us to do it, and we're going to move forward with that expectation to get the remaining part of the river surveyed in the same manner we did the southern section. And then we're trying to get some research uh, collaboration going uh, with the University of North Carolina, which is sort of the leader in hydrilla research for control. We already have some uh, plans and some, uh, and we're looking for funding. We'll probably do something no matter what funding we get, but we're looking for a pretty good, uh, I believe, a $50,000 grant uh, from the, the um, uh, National Aquatic Plant Management Society uh, to 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 do some work with the with the river hydrilla, looking at uh, tank tests for controls with herbicides, looking at how the um, eelgrass would be affected if herbicides were used. So they'd actually be testing these products with, with the uh, hydrilla and the eelgrass and with the hope that you would not 
control both. You'd only control the hydrilla. Uh, we're also open to other options. If something comes up that where we can research it, we'll be there. And we're going to try to um, obviously collaborate with the North the Northeast Aquatic Nuisance Species Panel. The United States Army Corps of Engineers is now um, in the in the mix here. So I think we've gone a long way in getting this started. We're not anywhere near solving the problem. Uh, we are certainly uh, at the phase where we have been able to, um, you know, uh, determine what the problem is, uh, which I think is a big start. Um, with that, I'm going to take questions. Just make sure everybody's acknowledged, and uh, you know, Margo and Jean and Riley and Chris Doyle from Solitude, and Torrance Downs, Nick Tipperary from Wisconsin, Judy Preston, Deanna Racky, who was our summer assistant last year, and Michael Monica. They were all big parts of this. And then we got the funders, you know, the um, uh, you know, Gateway uh, River Commission and, uh, you know, uh, River Cog, although I don't, I'm not sure they funded this, but they were a big part in, in establishing the funding, Eight Mile River. Um, and I probably missed somebody. I apologize if I did. So with that, I'll take questions. And Summer and I will take any questions you might have. I'm oh, not sure how it Greg, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Oh, this is uh, Rich Snosky. Hi, Rich. How you doing? Hey, um, have you looked into, done the research on what the salinity level is that hydraulic can tolerate in the lower Connecticut River? Uh, you know, I have not, I have not looked specifically into that, but if somebody has, I'm not sure if that information is there, but I will look into that. Uh, you know, I, we did not measure salinity. Um, you know, it would have been nice if we did, but salinity is going to change throughout the year, and it may only take short periods of very high salinity, like Long Island Sound type salinity, to to control um, uh, hydrilla in some of these plants. But we, to answer your question is no, we have not looked into that, uh, and I can look into to see if other people have. Well, I just was doing a literature search on it over the winter. I've been monitoring the salinity in Lord's Cove. And the literature, what I see, um, pretty much shows that over 10 pots per thousand hydrilla won't survive. Mm -hmm. And in Lord's Cove, it varies from zero up to 10 pots per thousand during mm -hmm. the year, and it varies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I... It sounds about right because again, Lord's Cove for us, and we had to go pretty far up into the tributaries and up, up, uh, you know, away from the main stem in order to find any of this. Um, so it seems to make sense. I think that would make would make sense. I I don't know what the salinity is in the river in various places. I don't know whether there's long term data, uh, but but if there is, I'd love to see it. Yeah. Okay. I'm monitoring it right now. So. Any other questions? Everybody's quiet. Um, just a direct link to this uh, to this app. Uh, a direct link. Okay, Summer, can you handle that question? Yeah, it's best if you go to our website. That's the easiest way to find it. If we go back in the slides, there is like a shortened link that I made. Um, this will get you there, but the easiest way is to go to our website, which is ct.gov slash C-A-E-S, um, and then you can find us through there. Thank you. So I know a lot of you people are, you know, you're on the river a lot, and obviously, you know, you, you, especially, you know, we're not going to be in the southern end, but, you know, you're going to, you're going to be the eyes and ears, I think, uh, for, uh, for a lot, for anything new that's occurring. Um, you know, uh, you have our map. I mean, if, if we start to see, like Rich, if you start to see hydrilla or anything down in that sort of southern end of Lord's Cove, that's going to be important to know. Um, you know, the, the water chestnut people, I think, are doing a great job. We're going to, we're going to, as we go north, I'm, hoping we can, you know, determine, you know, if there's more water chestnut than people have been realizing in some of the areas that maybe haven't been looked at. Um, let's hope there isn't. I am, I am, thank you. you know, we're hoping we don't find any new invasive species, you know, who knows, you know, who, you know, there's, 
you know, we'll be looking for not only some plants, if we happen to see something like uh, zebra mussels, um, we'll mention that. Okay, so there's a question here. Um, uh, should we pull hydrilla when we see it while pulling water chestnut and whalebone and Selden coves? Uh, you know, if it's if it's not a crazy amount of work, it's not going to hurt. Uh, it could help. I can't guarantee it's going to help a lot. Um, again, you leave any portion, and if the root system remains, a lot of times you can't get the entire root. Uh, it'll probably grow back. So, you know, I don't know, you know, what your level of enthusiasm for this is, but if it, you know, it could really, you know, set you back as far as getting th getting it done. And again, it's not easy. Sometimes you need a rake. You know, you got to rake the bottom, and you're going to leave stuff behind. There's always the, the chance of fragments you missing and then them floating away and rerooting. So it's not like it's, uh, I can't give you an enthusiastic yes that it's gonna be a big help. Uh, my guess is you'll get some of it, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the water chestnut, but I, I would say use your discretion uh, when you're out there. You know, it's not like it's, I think, gonna necessarily be a great, great help, but it could be somewhat of a help. Greg? Yes. Uh, this is Judy Preston. I, I'm wondering if you have any familiarity or know of any uh, folks who have either used suction as a means of, of uh, trying to work with hydrilla or um, uh, booms or um, netting. I know that there's some effort in the Hudson River to use a fine mesh because my understanding is, is that even the, the fragmented pieces can be problematic so that if you're uh, you know chopping it up or pulling it up and you're breaking off a lot of pieces that you know that's that's just going to float particularly because we have a tidal system mm -hmm. i'm wondering that's, if you you know that's i don't know yeah. so i don't know if i understand you judy com completely but it sounds like when you're harvesting water chestnut you want to you're afraid that you're going to be breaking off hydrilla fragments and you should be putting it in a mesh or you, you mean putting a mesh out over you know, the I'm, bottom? I'm mostly about hydrilla at this point because hydrilla is a little bit different animal, at least with trappa, it's a pretty hardy plant. You know when you've gotten it and you know when you haven't. But with mm -hmm. hydrilla, it's just so easy to see that if you're pulling it uh, or even if you're not pulling it just in the main stem of the river with the amount of boat traffic, uh, there are fragments that are drifting in with the tide into the various coves and embayments in the in the river, and uh, I think there has been success at a small scale. I, I get the impression uh, in the Hudson River with people going out with mesh to try to capture mm -hmm. that drift. Mm -hmm. so you're not getting small fragments that are at least you know accumulating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, anytime you can collect fragments. Now, I will tell you, if you know, we're out there, we're out there, especially in the fall. It tends to auto what's called auto fragment, meaning it, maybe this is a means of it it's spreading because the fragments not only contain the the, the stem pieces, but also contain the um, what's called turions, those above ground structures, which are very hardy, and they're all floating around. I mean, it's all over the river. I mean, it's not like, I mean, when you see how much fragments there, I wonder how much you know you and I or anybody's going to be able to make a dent in that. Uh, you know, the, the question came out uh, also here is, I think, a similar one uh, by Humphrey on does smothering work as an eradication method? And I, my guess is it will work. Now, we haven't worked with hydrilla with what's called these bottom blankets. So they sell these, and you can make them, but you can buy them as well. They're like a plastic type material, um, woven material with um, some holes for uh, gases to come out and you will you, you, they're usually something like 10 feet wide by 50 feet long and you can get, a, you can get them smaller as well but they have pieces of rebar in them to weight them down and you, they act as a just a, a way to smother plants and you know we always knew that would work and people would put them down for a year or more they put them down just leave them uh, we started testing whether or not it, not with hydrilla but with um, uh, fan wart and Eurasian water milk oil if, if they could be put down for as little as four weeks and then moved, 
with great control? And the answer is yes, we found great control with just four weeks. I'm surprised at that. Uh, I think there's something going on other than just um, uh, smothering or lack of light. I think there may be some chemicals building up underneath the bottom blankets uh, from the sediment that may be acting as a, a, a weak control. But yeah, I mean, that, that can work. But, you know, again, and I mentioned in the some of these marinas where, you know, they, they were the around boat areas and this and that, it would probably work really well. Um, but obviously, you know, in, in the main stem and in large areas, not so hot. Uh, you know, they also control apparently just about everything. I mean, so if you have desirable species, uh, you probably would control them as well. Um, say uh, eelgrass, uh, you would probably control the eelgrass as well. So again, everything has a uh, has a you know a good and a bad and uh, you know positive and negative. But uh, you know, so we're st we're at to be frank we're at the beginning of of being able to treat rivers. Uh, we'll be watching what some of the other people are doing. Uh, you know, when it comes to herbicides, you know, we always have to realize that that can be a controversial subject. Even a, what would be considered a very safe herbicide. Uh, is 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 going to be a a, a controversy. Uh, there's certainly when when you're dealing with water, it's not like it's just your land. The water is moving; it moves other people's uh, other people's areas, and they they may not want it uh, your herbicide in it when it gets to them. And you can't necessarily show that it's not going to happen. You also have a, a large number of state listed species, and those of us who have dealt with uh, Connecticut DEP regarding permitting for herbicides. You know, with with even one state listed species, you got to really show that you're not going to harm it. And uh, with a large number uh, in the Connecticut River system, uh, you know, you're going to have your work cut out for you um, with with that. So I think everything's still going to be on the table. We still need to get um, you know that northern section, northern two thirds surveyed to get get a good feel of what's there, and then I think we'll have a clearer view of what can be done. Um, okay, we got another question here from Jerry Roberts. I went to your, your site but could not find a link to the interconnecting maps you showed. Uh, Ed Pollock said, I couldn't find the app either. So let's. All right, let me. Um, yeah, not a problem. It can be a little tricky. Um, I'm going to go ahead and actually share my screen since it's already shared and I can show you exactly how to get there. So. If you go to ct. This is what I told you. Let me try it this way. And then programs and services, invasive aquatic plant program, survey results, and then we are under the why can't I find it? Connecticut River 2019. And then I have the app embedded here, so you can just see it once it loads or you can click this link. Um, but I can put this in the chat. And now you have the link. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, anything else? Well, hearing none, I think we'll turn it back to Jean. Okay, thank you, Greg and Summer. Um, and uh, it is, uh, we've gone over, but I think it was well worth it. You know, it's sort of like a fireworks finale. You, uh, you, you, you keep on wanting it to go on and on because it's uh, pretty compelling. And I think that Greg and Summer have presented a, uh, a, a fairly compelling presentation that we're going to, um, we're going to, you know, share all these resources. I've been cutting and pasting comments that everybody's had from the chat and, um, We'll definitely email out information to everyone um, as we get it. As Greg and Summer noticed, noted, they want to go the gateway first as they were the funders. But once that happens, um, we'll do that. Also, um, my, my webinar 
uh, poster person um, who would get it on our website is right in the middle of finals. Um, but as soon as she finishes finals, we will get everything um, edited and up onto our website um, to share the webinars with everybody. And uh, again, thank you. I appreciate everyone joining uh, joining us and um, and have a great summer. Yeah, Humphrey. Uh, 